everyone. How you doing in the chat room? It is a good morning up here in Northern Illinois. How's everything sounding? Hopefully we got this uh, damn mess uh, straightened out with the audio. Uh, we got Ironhead, we got Scott, Johnny, JB, Eric, and Ant, and everybody else in the room. If you guys haven't checked out uh, Dirty D's, man, he had an awesome video of uh, what's going down in Galveston right now. So go check him out. Also, quick announcement. Uh, December 14th, I will be doing a live show. It's a uh, rockin' the holidays bash. It's a benefit for Neon One Percenter. So we're gonna have a bunch of guests on the show. We'll be worldwide on all the platforms. So check us out if you can that day. We'll be talking everything, man. Motorcycle history. Be talking to Neon a little bit. Some of the other good shit out there. And on, uh, I think well, I'm actually doing an interview on Monday with uh, Tramps. Uh, motorcycle shop and uh i'll probably have that later in the week so let's start out the morning and morning from philadelphia it is actually man i feel sorry for you guys out in philly man you're cops holy shit let me tell you <laughs> well this uh story is gonna burn you before we get into the all the other good stuff and today the message of the haters ho ho do we got some shit for you that's gonna be a fun one for me anyway uh but check this shit out man this is how screwed up our country's really getting right now uh, there was a PSA announcement, actually it was a video, and it actually got taken down from YouTube because I guess people were pissed off about it, but this PSA encourages kids to steal their parents' guns and hand it over to teachers. Now, this is the crap that our kids are being taught. Now, the article goes on to say a startling new uh, anti-gun ad released by, <laughs> of course, a San Francisco-based production company encourages children to commit a series of crimes by stealing their parents' guns and turning them over to school officials. And this was reported on by the Daily Caller. It's called, now this is the production company, Sleeper 13 Productions released a controversial video. <laughs> it shows a potty young boy wandering into his parents' bedroom, stealing a handgun out of their dresser drawer and then shoving it into his backpack. The boy then carries what is presumably a loaded gun into his classroom. After his class, he approaches the teacher, takes the gun out of his backpack, and slams it onto the desk saying, can you take this away? I don't feel safe with a gun in my house. Our children deserve a safe war uh, world, the ad says, and stop the gun violence now. The video first appeared uh, on that blaze and has been met with sharp criticism, blah, blah, blah. But that shit is ridiculous. Now the left has our freaking kids going in there taking loaded freaking guns to school to hand them over to uh, their teachers. This Tuesday, this is why it's important, if you can vote, you better get your butts out there and vote because you can't cry when the shit comes down bad. This this is unreal, man. You can't have freaking kids going in the uh, grabbing loaded guns. You know, seven, eight, nine-year-old kids? Come on, man. That's freaking uh, screwed up. But, uh... You guys get it up and uh, hit it in uh, the chat room. Let me know what you guys think. Yo, live this Saturday lives. You're the man, Hollywood. Thanks, DD. Next, uh, you think with all that's going on with uh, that shit in Pittsburgh with uh, the pagans, you think that uh, this wouldn't be happening here? A North Burgeon man wearing a pagan's motorcycle uh, club clothing was arrested in Newark earlier Wednesday after he was spotted firing a gun. Uh, Larry Ortiz, 28, also tried to escape police by uh, speeding away from officers on his motorcycle. He eventually crashed. Uh, they responded uh, to the 100 block of Sherman Avenue, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, so yeah, this wasn't the best damn thing to do right now, especially with what's going on with the Mongols out on the West Coast, because now we have a government who wants to go and tell us that we have no rights to associate with people we want to. In those articles that have been going up, i actually been uh, sharing some with the mainstream media. It even says, the judge is quoted as saying, to the jurors as he was given uh, his uh, instructions, that this case is not about anybody going to jail. <laughs> but they're there to try to take the colors away. Now, everybody, and I don't care if you're an 81 supporter, a Mongol supporter, who the hell ever you support. If they are able to get this freaking injunction or able to get these and win this case, it goes way beyond motorcycle clubs. This goes to the heart of everything America is about. You're talking VFWs. Even hog chapters can get their shit taken by the government. They only need precedent to do this shit. So, you know, I've been having some people out there saying... Well, you know, the one percenters, they're getting it back because they deserve it. That's what they do to uh, smaller clubs and stuff. And I think you're real ignorant for saying that. And this is the reason why. It's not that I'm backing one percenters. It's because it, it, it's just like that Iron Order case in Pennsylvania. If they were able to find a way around the laws, the government trying to find a way around the laws then it would be easy to hit everybody else. And that's exactly what's happening here. So remember that when you're running out there and uh, say, you know, they deserve this and deserve that, then the next thing you know, they're going after the club that you like or you're a part of and all that crap. But uh, we're going to keep moving along. We're going to get into some other news. Right now we got uh, a cool video of uh, what's going down in uh, – Galveston and maybe uh, DD on his channel later on can uh, give you a heads up. But uh, let's take a look at this one right here. Mentioned the weather is perfect tonight and hopefully it'll be perfect for the next couple of days during this rally. But take a look. These are some of the motorcycles that are already starting to roll in here uh, along the strand in Galveston. More than a half million people, as you had mentioned, are expected to come out for this and 200,000 bikes expected to fill the streets here. The city expecting the fest to bring in more than $115 million into the local economy. And as the bikers roll into town, the city wants people to be aware of closures. The festivities will center around downtown, so several streets will be closed in that area. Parts of Seawall Boulevard will also be closed from 19th to 25th Streets. Eastbound traffic will stay open during the rally, but westbound traffic will be rerouted north down 19th Street. As for the city's trolley service, that will run its regular routes on extended hours and run an ongoing charter route between downtown and the seawall during the festival's busiest hours. They take care of everything pretty good. Uh, the people make sure they go in the same direction. It ain't been bad at all so far, but it's early. There are street closures, which you would expect here in Galveston, but I mean, I just got off the freeway earlier, and there's nothing but motorcycles headed into town. If we're just, they're just dialed up a perfect weekend. Yeah, the weather is perfect down there, we're hearing. Actually, good time Charlie's down there. He was on stage promoting his uh, film, Rebel in the Highway. If you haven't seen good time Charlie's uh, film, it's out on DVD, Blu-ray, all that good shit. He's also working on the Rough Riders. That's going to be the next movie. And I love what Good Time Charlie's doing, because usually in the media, any kind of movie that has to do with the biker lifestyle, you're out there drug running, gun dealing, all that good shit. So it's good to see that uh, Good Time Charlie's out there actually representing what uh, bikers are really about. So hats off to you, Charlie. Kick ass down there. Rock and roll. Jose, what's up, Southside? Anyway, we got uh, Paul, we got uh, Eric in here, man. We got a uh, chemo. Damn, are we filled up there? And how you doing, Tracy? Oh, man, good stuff down there, good stuff. Next one we got, uh, there's an awesome uh, memorial that just went up, the Fallen Bikers out west. They just got it done, and uh, it's something special because across the street, they, uh, there was actually a really bad, uh, accident, I guess, uh, 
three German tourists was killed out there on a motorcycle. So it's coincidence, but uh, what a memorial that this really is. So check this out, guys. ...into a stirring memorial for hundreds of bikers who have died in Wyoming. Ironically, the motorcycle memorial sits across the highway from a tragic accident that killed three bikers. Color Race Penny Preston reports the location was a coincidence. Downtown Cody sees plenty of visitors on their way to Yellowstone and Grand Teton every summer, including bikers who tour the parks and other scenic areas of northwest Wyoming. Unfortunately, some die here. In June 2016, three German bikers were killed when a pickup driver veered into their lane and hit them head on. It was a tragedy that uh, still, I think, haunts people in the Cody area. These were visitors in our area. Wyoming Department of Transportation spokesman Cody Beer says too many bikers are dying on Wyoming highways. In the last 22 years, there's been over 360 motorcycle fatalities in Wyoming. Um, 17 last year in Wyoming and 15 so far in 2018. Michael Deglo is a biker and he's lost biker friends on Wyoming highways. He decided to build a memorial to motorcyclists who have died and two friends offered to let him use their land in Wapiti, directly across from the site of the 2016 triple fatality. It's just pure coincidence that that is there, but that, you know, that just adds to the nostalgia of the memorial. I mean, that just shows people we got a memorial, and then we got three fatalities right across the street. It makes people think. Dayglow held a fundraiser to buy the materials and got some help from friends to build it. He put the final touch of a flag just two weeks ago. But even while he was building the memorial, Cody businessman Joe Boydston died in a motorcycle accident north of Cody. Dayglow turns on flashing lights at the memorial when a biker dies. He heard about Boydston's and another biker's death at the same time. So I had the lights flashing for Joe and the other guy. And I looked up and there was a double rainbow right over here. From Wabity, I'm Penny Preston that's an awesome memorial there. Uh, it's a sad thing. I know uh, when you go out to these big uh, rallies like uh, Sturges, you go down the Daytona, Myrtle Beach, and stuff like that, you have a lot of people that end up uh, getting hurt, getting killed, uh, either by a uh, freaking these cagers out there or, you know what, our ignorance, but drinking and driving and shit like that. Uh but our next one is everybody's favorite is the legends of the motorcycle scene. And this is my favorite era because I actually got to grow up with these guys, you know, as a kid and shit. Uh, you know, they were from the 70s. I call it the Vietnam era, the 60s and 70s. And uh, that's when the chopper scene, boy, the 60s and 70s was uh, rocking and freaking rolling. I think uh, it was that air that actually defined what a lot of the lifestyle was about with uh, the beer, bikes, broads. And hey, man, I'm not trying to be an asshole to our women listeners, but uh, that's the way it was uh, like back then. It was a hell of a freaking time, a hell of a party. That's when bikers truly knew what freedom was. And that's probably where freaking Harley Davidson stole their new line because it's not made of America they're pushing anymore. It's freedom. Well, freedom was uh, experienced in the 60s and 70s, let me tell you. It was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And a lot of us, especially uh, my generation, really looked up to them guys. They were really true men that uh we're back in that scene and boy did they know how to freaking party let me tell you but we had sugar bear on uh for our legends uh this week we also had taco bowman and uh jr from the uh sons of silence on legends so hopefully you enjoy that one thing about sugar bear and this kind of relates to uh this era of motorcycle uh Many didn't even know he worked on the Easy Rider bikes, you know, Stars and Stripes. And one of the main reasons was back then they didn't uh, want to, you know, because he was black and stuff like that. So they didn't want that to interfere with uh, what they were pushing and shit like that in the movie. And, getting, you know, it all came down to making money. 
is what that came down to. But finally, Sugar Bear is uh, getting his own. Uh, damn, you know, I seen a post out there where one of the fans on the show said, I'd give my uh, both balls for a Sugar uh, Bear front end. I said, add mine too, because I'll give mine with it to get one of them fucking front ends. He still does, to this day, make them by himself, by his own hands. Now, that's American uh, quality right there and something to be proud of. But another legend uh, that I wanted to bring up today is John Harmon. He is a king, a king in the chopper air. Sadly, you know, he died from cancer. I think he was only like 40 or 41 years old. But a lot of what you see chopper-wise is from him. You know, a lot of his ideals, you know, the drawings that he used to make. Uh, he was true old school, man. Uh, like his wife says in this video, he liked uh, bringing the bike inside of the house, building it inside of the house. When it was done, pulling it away. And that's a lot of stuff that we lost nowadays in today's scene. You know, most of the time it's, hey, let's take the bikes up to the Harley Davidson dealer and uh, let them do it. We don't want to do nothing with it. And you know what? These newer freaking bikes, I guess, yeah, you know, you have to. There's so many damn electronics on these fucking bikes. You know, I seen, uh, what was it, uh, Adam Sandoval's uh, comparison between uh, the Indian and his Harley. It's like, damn, man, what the hell you need all them fucking electronics for? Now Harley's getting sued, you know, besides there is a recall on the clutches, let me put that out there. I think 173,000 bikes are affected by that. But out of Cook County, our hometown of uh, Chicago, uh, they got a class action lawsuit against Harley Davidson for the TM or TPM uh, sensor, tire monitoring sensor. And come on, you're suing Harley over a freaking uh, tire monitoring sensor? It has gotten really freaking bad. And that's why I like harking back to the old days when the bikes didn't have all this electronic shit. I still, personally, every bike I've owned never had a radio because I can't get over having a radio. You know, I know a lot of the guys love radios and shit. Me, personally, I can't get into it. Uh, I love hearing those pipes. I love hearing it going down the road and shit like that. I love boobs too, uh, Ironhead, Eric. Boobies! Hey, Captain Drift is in the uh, chat room right now. Boy, I want to fucking smoke a fucking doobie with him, man. He, I sit there and we just chill and have all kinds of good freaking time. <laughs> and you're right, JB, having uh, a car. Me, I can't get past an old one, fat boy. Uh, once I get uh, done with that one, it'll probably go uh, Indian. I don't know, man. I don't know yet. So we'll see. The reviews are out there. And uh, give it a couple more years to uh, see how Indian is doing. But let's take a look at uh, John's video. And then we'll get into uh, a good question. Actually, it's a debate question on uh, Ask Hollywood. And uh, the hater stain is going to be fun. <laughs> Let me tell you. Here we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Before we got married, he built it in the living room of the house I had and pushed it out the front door. His favorite thing to do was build motorcycles, of course. He, he thought about motorcycles all the time. He kept a pad and pencil right by the bed because he would dream about it and he'd wake up and draw out whatever he dreamed about. So that was quite a passion. Whatever John did, he was... On the way to Angel's camp. He was broke down alongside the road. Uh, so we stopped and uh, helped him out and uh, continued on, went to Angel's Camp, and after that we just became good friends. Uh, John <laughs> Harmon and Harry Holland, and later Bill Holland, started a motorcycle company up in the Sa Sacramento area, I believe it was in Roseville. And these people were creative geniuses. He had some ideas on this front end that he hadn't really been working on yet and that he shared with me. John taught me how to weld, but he taught me everything about the front end, how to do it. And then a couple years down the road, him for him, for whatever reason, him and my brother, they split the company up. I stayed with John, and so John and I partnered up. And at that point, I was in charge of building all the front ends, and he was in charge of building the frames. The whole front end sold for $150 back in the 70s. It cost us $50 to chrome the front end. I made $50. John took $50 and paid the material costs out of everything like that. His frames were sleek and laid out type of affairs. 
versus the ones that were looked like modified Harley Davidsons. John was always thinking about how to increase performance. Frames were just unique in that they were light, uh, all chromoly frames. It's just the material that is used. It's just a stronger tubing that is able to flex without cracking as bad. Well, all the front ends were made with uh, 4130. That was John Harmon right there, man. Uh, you gotta, you can't tell me that those kind of images from the '70s, especially if you're my age, ain't uh, what got you into uh, being in a biker. Let me tell you. I remember the first time, uh, shit, I was a kid. <laughs> I was like eight or, or seven or eight years old in Chicago, and two people in uh, general, they were ex-wheelmen. Uh, just came down blasting down the street on them uh, choppers and stuff. This had to be, uh, fuck, 81 or 80. And that's really what I, that was the image in my head of what uh, being a biker was. Being carefree, having fun, and not giving a hell about what anybody had to say. And I bet Cap, Captain, man, how was the freaking... Uh, 70s man i bet you can tell some stories uh about how it was back then and uh let's see your cab 62 fl very modified rock on rock on uh so yeah you got to give your hats off the john you got to give your hats off the sugar bear because they really you know <laughs> they really uh, amplified what it was to be in the biker lifestyle back then and it's gave us uh a lot of good memories hopefully one of these days we'll get back to that type of uh lifestyle it's more pc now than it's ever been shit you and that's why i don't like going to the major rallies uh i i been to daytona a lot but uh those bigger rallies it ain't about out there camping partying having a freaking uh fun letting it loose and shit it's more corporate than it is ever now what's up irene how you doing love you too honey uh and that's what's sad is we let our lifestyle be taken over by corporate interest <laughs> here i am talking corporate interest that's mostly politics but uh that's what has happened you know you go to sturgis what are you laying out you know four or five thousand dollars uh for a trip or you're laying you know the same down in daytona and it's a real shame, you know, down there. I really do uh, support the the vendors down there, especially the small businesses, but I don't support uh, the corporate takeover of the lifestyle and shit like that. Uh, just like uh, in our legends with uh, JR, uh, when I was reading that article, when they were back then, it was only like a couple hundred freaking bikes that were at that event. 
now you got what a half a million there that's all the time so it's really it sucks <laughs> for what they did to the the lifestyle taking it over and shit like that but again hopefully we'll get uh back to where we need Lena Dave, LA man, how you doing? I am fucking jealous. You guys have all that nice weather, and I'm stuck here in the fucking cold. <laughs> anyway, let's go to and this next. Uh, this is actually was just put on the the channel this morning. Uh, and JB, hell yeah, with the sixty one pan. We do got some, uh, we got a special coming up on that. Hopefully I can get uh, JB on talking about that book, or, uh, that bike. So, but let's go to this question. See what you guys all think. And this was anonymous. And this is a good debate question. Hollywood, I have respectably disagree with you on the patch burning. Let me say... I disagree with the burning of any legitimate club's patch, but I equate burning a kinfolk patch to burning a son's anarchy or Mayans patch. Having the same outrage over a kinfolk patch being burnt that one would have overseen a legitimate club's patch burnt just gives the kinfolk a level of legitimacy. What they have earned, in fact, the way they have run themselves is a slap in the face to every legitimate club, that has put decades of the time and effort into forming and growing their club legitimately. If the Kim folk truly want to be legitimate, they need to completely start over and build themselves from the ground up with proper hang around and prospects times, proper background checks, proper charter sizes, not these one person chapters to claim to have chapters. And you know what? Anonymous, I do agree with 90% of what you just put. It is important for a club to be out there doing shit the right way. And, you know, people go, well, who are you to say they need to be doing shit the right way? Well, you know, the stuff that Kim Folk has brought up upon themselves with having cops in the club, having a diamond and shit like that, uh going out there and causing, you know, all kinds of ruckuses, like that shit down in Florida where the guy shot into the SUV with two kids because it was merging over. Yeah, that's a lot of fuckery. Uh, but with the patch burning incident, you got to remember with uh, Kinfolk, and now uh, I've been informed that uh, there's a guy that I do know uh, that's an ex Dito that has some street cred behind him, has taken the uh, the reins of the club, and uh, he says it's getting straightened out. And basically, they're going back to the building blocks of getting rid of all the bullshit. That way it can get uh, legitimate again. Uh, because Kinfolk actually started out as Dito's, uh, their core crew. And Dito's, as you know, go through a hardcore prospect time and all that good shit. So the guys who originally started Kinfolk uh, earned their patches through the Ditos. They didn't like what was going on with the Ditos. You know, you had all that shit where there was the big split and stuff. And then you had some other shit go on here in the United States. That's none of my damn business or yours. Uh, so they decided to leave uh, and form their own shit. Which, if you're on the streets, hey man, shit ain't working right. You got to do what you got to do. But when they went and did all this internet bullshit and started just handing out patches, getting cops in there that, you know, you can't have cops in your club that are, you know, with a 1% or diamond. That's just foolish. But from what I hear, this guy uh, took over the national presidency and he started to clean house and, you know, get shit back together. So, Anonymous, I do agree with you on 90% of what you said. The problem with the flat, uh, the patch burning is, is there was some, you know, and still are, there was hardcore guys and kinfolk, and that woman could got hurt. Especially, you imagine if a woman was burning that patch, you know, 20 years ago, shit, 30 years ago, what could have happened to her? And that's really what I'm worried about, is what could happen to her, because you get some Yahoo or some shit like that who wants to go out there, make a name for themselves, and next thing you know, you got a dead woman laying on the side of the road. So, 
yeah, patch burning of any type of colors. You don't know who you're dealing with, you know, who you think you're dealing with, and it could end awful for uh, all parties involved. So that's really what I was uh, talking about on that subject. Again, let's hope uh, they get it together, man. You know, it would be cool, you know, see them go up because I originally did a good article on them because it was that core base of the Banditos. But uh, our next segment, we're going to have some fun here because, uh, I, you know what? I knew I wanted to leave this shit out, <laughs> but you just got to reply, man, when some shit like this is sent out. So this is a message to the haters. <laughs> and introducing Jabba the Cunt, Raider of Buffets Everywhere. <laughs> anyway, here, you know, I guess he was out there woofing because of uh, the article that exposed his ass even more this uh, week. But, uh, and you know what, this is really the last time I'm uh, <laughs> going to be talking about Jabba the Cunt. Uh, because it's just getting freaking ridiculous and boring with the dude. But here's some of the stuff that's being sent to me from his BBS group. And it's quite funny, actually, if you think about it. You got guys calling brothers on this fucking thing. You got him calling people brothers. And they live across country, never met, anything like that. And that's the reason why the word brothers... It's watered down in the, the, the biker scene right now. And why use it? Everybody's fucking calling everybody brothers. They don't know what the fuck it means. But uh, anyway, let's go to some fun here, shall we? This is the best thing out here. It's the real deal. You have the right men for the job. You all doing it together. And it's needed by many out there. Hell, this is still new, but it's only going to grow and grow. I see, see big things. Man, I think we got an Iron Legacy on our hands. I think we got another Lollipop Lebeski. I think it's in the making. I really do. Pretty soon you'll be seeing them sell patches like that Cosmic Rider bullshit he wrote about in his book. So let's go to the next one. Ride the fuck on. Need to keep this movement going. With full momentum, no room or time for the false flaggers. Weed them out and move on. And we get the shit to do. Oh my god, what kind of freaking movement it is this? You guys are bikers. You really need education that bad? You can't go out on the freaking street and learn it? Oh my god. And then you got a fucking job at a hunt, cunt fucking uh, encouraging you freaking guys. All right, here we go. I love this next one. Hey, you took my goddamn name. I don't like that shit. Billy James Caldwell says, laugh my ass off. That insane cunt is a fuck dog. He don't ride because he spends all his time online in his mom's house. Man, you'd have tell he from overseas the way he spells mom. <laughs> anyway, that, and then a uh, freaking job of a cunt comes back and calls me insane cunt. That ain't cool taking my shit. You know what? If you want to bash on me, at least be original. Don't take my shit. That's fucking uncool, man, if you tell me. Anyway, if that's the freaking case, whatever, man. Uh, you guys can see me on, uh, I do do a lot of uh, stuff uh, with rallies and stuff like that. I get invited out to uh, DJ and all that kind of shit. And do shows like we will be doing December 14th. So don't forget that we'll be live for three hours. We're going to uh, combine like a telethon, shit like that. Uh, for Neon One Percenter, I'll have special guests talking about uh, the motorcycle scene and having a real cool guy. Anyway, let's see here. Mike Oates, guy who has a channel on biker education, comes here to do what? Learn? No, no way is he coming to start shit. Hey, Jackknot, Mike, I don't go on your channel. I'm not a part of your channel. <laughs> These are your idiots sending in all the shit to Insane Throttle. So, job of the cunt. Get a hold of your fucking people, man. You might want to keep on clearing the motherfuckers out, dude, because they keep on sending the shit. <laughs> anyway, hopefully you enjoy that. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it comes down to uh, hopefully it don't happen. Uh, hopefully we don't see another Iron Legacy out there and shit. 
Thanks, Long Rider. You are awesome, my man. Uh, let me know when you get that thing. Uh, but it comes down to being real. Uh, looking at uh, the shit in the book, then looking at uh, his club's response. And you know what? I guess I'm a, <laughs> he calls me a punk. I didn't uh, have my old lady hand in my patches there, Butterball. You know, I didn't hide in another room while your patches were picked up. That was you, Big Bad Dank Gangster. And I also didn't out Junior's dad out of the Cicero crew. So remember that in my book. But anyway, enough of that freaking nut nut. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, are enjoying the show. Uh, next week, we're going to have freaking... I'm going to get it to where you guys can actually call me while I'm talking. So we, we got it set up. I know I've been having a lot of issues with uh, the sound. And it's because it's new equipment. I'm used to the analog shit. I'm not used to this electric shit. <laughs> this uh, digital crap. Holy God. Oh, my God. It drives me nuts. Uh, but anyway, I want to thank everybody for the orders of the book. And I want to thank Long Rider for his donation of uh, a set of books. Uh, for those who uh, purchased signed copies. Uh, that goes to uh, Neon's uh, fundraiser. Uh, again, December 14th is going to be a batch, man. A batch. I'm trying to get a broads out there, strippers, whatever, man. We're going to have an old school time, I'll tell you what. <laughs> but uh, book sales are going great. The New Age Viking Brotherhood and the new one. Everybody's been asking me about this Iron Order book. The Iron Order book that I just wrote was uh, a middle of the road approach. I actually wanted to look at how the, the scene has changed since Iron Order came onto uh, the set. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty critical of them, pretty critical of them in that book. But, uh, yeah, that's out new and stuff like that. Uh, let's see here, Sticks and Stones. <laughs> it's funny, this fucking guy. Anyway, <laughs> call-in would be great. Yeah, I'm going to have the call-ins next uh Saturday, I'm almost there, I promise. I'm almost there with all this bullshit. So I really, I could never watch the show when Big Boy was on. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> anyway, if you guys have any uh, ideals for the show, I would really appreciate that. Uh, if you want to hear some subjects, I'm always here for you. Go ahead and uh, email us at info at InsaneThrottleBikerNews.com, and uh, I'll get to them ideals. But uh, with that said, hope you guys enjoyed the show. Love seeing the chat room just freaking lighting up and uh, you guys talking because I really like the channel to be a debate channel. That's why I kind of keep it low in the, the numbers and stuff like that because uh, if I have it on Facebook or something and the stream it gets so messed up where you can't debate each other, and uh, all that good stuff. But you guys be careful. You gals be careful this weekend. Uh, be safe. Watch out for the cagers in the warmer climate areas. In uh, the colder ones, man, uh, cabin fever has started for us. <laughs> but uh, you guys all take care. Hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, in the next couple weeks, one last announcement. I will be joined. By China Dow. She will be doing some uh, segments with me. You know, maybe some new segments going around the country or something. But we'll find her a place to go. She's a hottie, let me tell you. We're going to spike this sucker up, this show, and keep moving in the right direction. If you guys are in the northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin uh, area on December 14th, please stop by the Rockin' the Holiday Bash. It's going to be something else, man. We're going to get old school on that motherfucker. And again, I'll be uh, live streaming it if you cannot be there for three hours. So you guys enjoy everything and be safe. I'll talk to you all later.